So without further ado, please help me welcome Jean-Luc Dumont. Universities are drivers of progress, innovation, change. They conduct research, they publish papers, they take patents in a world they invent. Are drivers of progress, innovation, change. They conduct research, they publish papers, they take patents in a world they invent. You know that. You're probably part of that, all of you. So it's all the more surprising to me that universities would be so little innovative, so resistant to change in the way they operate. And I'm not referring about administration. I could, really, but not even what I had in mind now. No, I'm thinking of two areas that are key activities for universities. One of them is communication. Scientific, scholarly communication, writing papers, giving talks, making graphs. Some of you have heard me speak here at the University of Chicago on those topics in the past. And you know that I'm always happy to challenge everything you thought you knew about communication. You may have heard me say that we need to change the world. We need to change our ways. And the good news is those of you who do that are usually extremely successful with those new ways of communication. Now, the other one without surprise, is teaching. That's another area where you see so little innovation, so much resistance to change. Think about it. The University of Chicago is, what, about 120 years old or something? So in what sense is the teaching that is taking place today different from the teaching that took place here a century ago? And don't tell me about technology, right? Yes, we can project slides directly from the computer. We can stream lectures in video over the net. But quite frankly, that is not a fundamental change. And if you ask me, I'm not even sure it's a change for the better. Now, take the university where I did my undergraduate engineering studies, University of Louvain. That one is almost six centuries old. It was created in 1425. 1425. You realize what that means? The printing press had not been invented yet. <laughs> Think about it. Most of the teaching that is taking place still today in some of the best universities around the world are very much pre-Gutenberg teaching. The professor is writing on the board from his notes, and the students are copying that in their own notes. So this is ensuring that the notes of the professor become the notes of the students without the material crossing the brain of either of them, really. This has got to be the least efficient photocopy machine in the history of mankind. Come on, we can do better than that. Why do we keep doing that six centuries later? Well, one of the problems is that we are exposed to that kind of teaching at a very young age. And then we tend to reproduce it without ever questioning it, because it's really deep in our system of beliefs. It's a bit like parenting, really. You know, Some days I'm saying something to my kids, and I think, damn, I sound exactly like my parents. And that is not a nice realization in my case, but I guess it's really deep in my memory circuits for some reason, and so is teaching. Still, what I propose we do in this lecture this morning is challenge that. It is to try to come up with a better way of teaching, a more effective way. Now, let's not try to change for the heck of changing things, right? We need a good reason. But the reason is just that, it's effectiveness. You know that the pace of life has never been this high. We have less time than ever before for what we want to do. So what's really dear to my heart is to try to stop doing useless things in the classrooms. We don't have time for useless things. We need to be a lot more efficient. Let's see what we can do in this presentation. Three levels without surprise. 
you want to be effective, the first question is, what are you trying to achieve? We need to talk about objectives. Without objectives, nothing else matters. The next one, once you have the objectives, is strategies. OK, we have the objective. How do we get there? And then the third one for which we certainly leave, need to leave enough time is success factors. I hear way too many people who try and then they tell me, oh, you know, th those new methods of teaching, which are really not that new, they're at least 2,000 years old, they tell me, uh, I've tried, it doesn't work. What that probably means is they were not in the favorable circumstances for that. If you want those methods to work, you need to take care of those success factors. And at the end of the presentation, I'll give you on the screen a URL where you'll find lots of handouts for the various presentations I gave, including some material about uh, teaching. Oh, and another thing is many attendees to our sessions have asked us if they could be kept informed of the sessions we run around the world or the new resources we put online. So if you're interested in being put on our mailing list that we send just a few times a year, leave us a name and an email address, and I'll be happy to add you. Objectives, we were saying. Well, if this were not teaching, if I was lecturing to you about, say, oral presentations, then I would love to use a traditional model of the type emitter, channel, receiver. Works fine for communication. Unfortunately, that's a model that doesn't work very well for teaching and learning, especially if you realize that when teachers, professors, teaching assistants, use a model like that, they really use only half of it, right? They focus on the emitter. And pretty much every professor I've talked to, and by that I mean the, the traditional professors. Mm, lots of professors are trying hard to do better these days, but if you take the, the cliche of the professor, you ask that person, what's your criterion for success? What would make you say at the end of a lecture that you've done a good job? I talk about self-assessment. People typically tell me, well, I'll be happy if I have covered the material. And then I push a little bit and I say, covering the material, huh? what a good idea. What does that mean? Well, they say, well, they don't say, but they imply, if I have said everything out loud once, whether students hear me or not, whether students understand what I say to them or not, is irrelevant. We have only half of the communication channel. You must have seen professors like that. And they're obsessed with the material. I've had that just the last few days. I'm, I'm touring the Midwest at the moment, speaking in lots of campuses. And when I speak on speaking, giving oral presentations, it never fails. I'll have someone to say, yes, you, you told us to focus on the message, but what if you have a lot of information to get across? And I try to see what it's all about. You say, you mean teaching? Yeah. And I say, then, well, are you sure you have to get all that information across? They say, oh, yes, of course. Of course I have to. And I have to really means out loud once, right? If you say, well, what about you give them a textbook? They can read, can't they? So let them read in the book. No, 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 I have to say that out loud once. Big obsession with that. In fact, I try to reason with those teachers with the following scheme. I say, imagine this. You have covered all of the material, very good. But because you had to rush, students probably did not get much out of it. They may only get 10% out of it. So as a, as a bloody engineer, I cannot help but calculate a yield out of that. 10% of 100% is 10%. Even that is leaving them unfazed because they tell me, you know, whatever. They still succeed the exam, so I must not do a very bad job, huh? I feel like telling them, you know, they don't succeed the exam thanks to you. They succeed the exam despite what you have done in the classroom. <laughs> Took me a while to learn that one. I remember saying to some, some professor at some point, you know, when I was a grad student at Stanford, I feel I have learned a lot. I must have had extremely good teachers. And he just laughed at me and he said, wait a minute, Stanford University or University of Chicago, whatever big one in the US, they are selecting their students. They are selecting learners. You'd put a monkey in front of those students, they would still learn. <laughs> so the fact that you pass the exam does not mean the professor has been helping you. 
So I try the following thing with professors, and I say to them, suppose you only cover half of the material. And then I have to stop, because there is an uproar in the room, and they tell me, oh, you can't do that. I say, OK, it's a thought experiment. OK, just imagine. Imagine you only cover half. You sacrifice deliberately half. Now, proportionally, you have double the time for that material. You can do more interesting things. And let's not get too optimistic. Imagine that even so, that you explain so much better with more time, you do other things, students are unlikely to assimilate more than half. OK, half of half is still a yield of 25%. In other words, by sacrificing half of the material, you have, in fact, been two and a half times more efficient. You did a job two and a half times better. Don't be obsessed with the content. And those are intelligent people. Heck, they are faculty. And they look at me and they say, yes, of course, yeah, I understand what you mean. But I still can't do that. And I feel like banging my head on the table saying, come on. If this were money, you would do it immediately. If I were to tell you only invest half of your money and you get two and a half times the return, of course they would do it. But for something like this, as I was saying, it's really deep in their emotional circuits for some reason. They just can't see themselves doing that. And that's a pity. The first thing to do is challenge this obsession with content. Why is it that professors do that? Well, I can understand in a sense. It's, it's natural, but it still doesn't work. They're trying to protect their back. You know, it's a bit like all those warnings you have in user's guides. I'm a very naive person, so for a long time I thought that all those warnings were meant to protect the users from harm. And one day I woke up and I realized that not at all, they are really meant to protect the manufacturers from litigation. So you buy any small device with a battery in it and you get a full US letter size page of warnings about using batteries. Net result, you don't even start reading the first of those warnings because you don't have the kind of time it takes to read a whole page about batteries. You get exactly the opposite effect. Self-protection seldom yields, gets you to meet your objectives. You want to know the, the best analogy ever that I was given to hear about university teaching, and I'm not going to do it for real out of respect for the room, but this guy came with a pitcher of water and an empty glass. And he said, this is the professor full of knowledge. This is the student, no knowledge yet. And then he said, this is university teaching. And he poured the whole of the pitcher next to the glass. I think that's really what's happening, right? Professors, they mean well, come on, I don't want to accuse them of bad intentions, but they are sending everything they could possibly send without worrying for a second whether it's actually received on the other end. Maybe by sending a little less, but aiming in the right place, they would get some of that knowledge, if you like that model, into the class. So let's switch from focusing on the left side to focusing on the right side. How about we, focusing, we focus now on the students? Will they assimilate the material? What does assimilate mean? Well, that's a difficult question. In the first step, you could just ask yourself, do they even remember? What would make them remember better? Well, when I was a kid, the question was already much researched. And at the time, the whole idea was to say, look, if they just hear it, they will remember so much. If they see it, instead of hearing it, they will remember much more, maybe twice as much. Don't take the numbers too seriously. It's always a little fuzzy. And then the big idea was, you know what? If they hear and see at the same time, they will remember more. More than hearing only, more than seeing only, but especially more than the sum. There is some effect of synergy. Now, if you ask me, the words are very misleading. If you think hearing and seeing, you are really thinking about the transducer. And the real truth behind this here is the CPU, what's going on inside. You should really say verbal and nonverbal. Because if it's text, whether you learn it better by hearing it or you learn it better by seeing it, that is really a question of personal preferences for each person. 
it doesn't yield that kind of statistics. But if you say it's words compared to non-words, like a picture, then you start seeing that kind of differences. You want to go further than that? Well, the quantum jump is if you stop having passive students and you say, hey, audiovisual revolution, sound and pictures, and you go towards active learning. For example, how about you don't say it to them, you make them say it. Better than saying it, you make them do it. Even better, you make them discover it. You don't even tell them how to do it, you let them figure it out. There's always a price to pay, that's going to take more time, but there is a return on that time. They will remember what they discover themselves for the rest of their life, pretty much. So let's see if we can focus that on active learning. Still, remembering may not even be what you want. What exactly do you want from the students? Can you maybe go away from those exams that just ask students to regurgitate what they were supposed to remember? Well, for that, you need to tackle at last this famous notion of objective. The objective is not the material. If you teach chemistry, the objective is not chemistry. What's missing in that picture is the capacity that you want the students to acquire about the material. Yes, it's about chemistry. What do you want them to be able to do? So if you've ever heard about pedagogical objectives, you know the canonical form of that. By the end of the whole quarter, semester, or the lesson, or the first 15 minutes of the lesson, the students or the learners will be able to and then you choose a verb, and everything is in that verb. You want to do self-assessment, like Elizabeth was mentioning again this morning, then try to choose an observable verb. If you say students will be able to understand, it may seem like a good idea, it's a bit of a catch-all, you can always say that. The question is, how do you see that? And if you tell me, oh, okay, no problem, I can see if they understand. For example, if they are able to solve problem 7.2 in the textbook, that's a sign they have understood. Well, well, then say that. Don't say they understand, say directly. Students will be able to solve problems involving blah, 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 such as 7.2. You want to be even more accurate, you want an even bigger help to your teaching. You could add criteria and means. When you say they must be able to solve problems of that type, okay, if at the exam you give them five problems, do they need to solve all five of them to get a pass? Or is it good enough if they solve three out of five? You could build that in the objectives if you wanted to, and the same for the means. Should they be able to solve those problems with their textbook or without their textbook, with, with a pocket calculator, with a computer? What are the means you put at their disposal to reach the objectives? All of that can help you. You've got good objectives, you've got self-assessment, you've got time management as well. Your professor told you you had to cover so many exercises, let's say a new session as a teaching assistant. After half of the time, you are nowhere near half of the exercises. Is it an issue? Well, that depends on the objectives. If all problems have got to do with the same objective, maybe it was better to spend more time on the first one and do it well and skip a few of the latter ones. If it's a different objective for each of them, it's more of a problem if you're late. At the same time, if those objectives build on each other, then you could also say, look, as long as they don't get, they don't reach the objective for problem one, there is no point going to problem two because we're not there yet. The prerequisites are not there. You want to know if you did well by the end of your session? Well, again, there are lots of ways, but you've got observable objectives. You just look at your students and you can see if they have reached the objective, if they have developed the capacity that you wanted them to develop. Inversely, if they had the capacity already, you didn't suspect that, but in fact they are perfectly able to do what you want them to be able to do, then you can save time, right? Don't waste their time making them do things that they master already. Go to the next objective on your list, in a sense. How do you get the objectives as a teaching assistant? You didn't invent the course, you're just there because your professor told you you had to be, maybe. Go see the professor and ask for the objectives. Don't be surprised if you don't get objectives and you get material. What's the objective, professor? Well, it's uh, organic chemistry. No, that's the material. 
what's the objectives, insist, ask, argue, discuss respectfully but firmly. And if you don't get there, then figure out the objectives by yourself one way or the other. Do not start teaching without objectives. If you think the exam is reflecting the objectives, just go look at the exam of last year and deduce from that exam what the objectives must have been. If you don't even have that, then use your common sense, just, just invent, but if you don't have an objective, there's no self-assessment, there is, there's nothing in terms of knowing what you are doing. Have objectives. Once you have that, how can we change the emitter channel receiver model that we had? Well, let me propose that learning is, I almost feel like saying, a relationship between two words. And when I ask training participants, it never fails. They say, of course, students, professor, teacher. And I go, no, 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 no. Bad news for your ego. You, the teacher, the teaching assistant, the faculty, whatever, you are not part of this equation. You are out of the picture. It's interaction between, yes, the students and the material. You want to teach them to be able to do something about the material, they have to interact with that material in a way that develops that capacity. We'll see how in a moment in point two, strategies. You have all learned lots of things, I'm sure, without a teacher. You want a, a simplistic example from my own kids? They have learned how to open a bottle and close a bottle on their own. It's not like when my son turned three, I took him apart and I said, son, you're old enough now. I'm going to teach you how to open a bottle this way. <laughs> uh, there is something else in that uh, teaching and learning. We'll get back to that. It's a very important success factor. Motivation. Why did they learn to open bottles, you think? <laughs> because there was something inside the bottle that they really wanted, that's an important success factor. You have learned a lot without teachers. Okay, I have respect for your ego as a teacher, so let me put you back in the scheme, and I will even compensate by putting you above the students in the scheme. There you go. What's the problem? You do not have a direct control on learning. You cannot take students and say to yourself, whether they want it or not, I will make them learn. It's not the way it works. You cannot open their heads, put the knowledge or whatever, or the capacity inside, and then close the skull again. You only have indirect actions. You can take care of the material, or you can take care of the students. Taking care of the material, that's the most obvious one. That's teaching in a restricted sense. It's lecturing, and I'm willing to bet that's what most of you have seen a lot in your studies. My uh, favorite picture of that, when, when I was asked to develop a series for Nature, the, the journal on, on the, the website, nature.com, and I discussed that with the editor, we really wanted to put a section on teaching, and for all of the sections, we had Jorge Cham do the cartoons. You know who Jorge Cham is? He's the guy who does PhD comics. If you don't know PhD comics, then go see PhD comics. So many decades after the end of my PhD, it's still therapeutic for me to go and see that. And I go, oh, you mean I wasn't the only one going through that kind of thinking at the time. Go see that. Here's the one that he came up with for the part on teaching. That's the professor who, in fact, thinks that students are really a burden. It would be so much simpler to teach without students when you think of it. Come on, they're always in the way. Just be busy with the board, be busy with the material. That's fascinating. They could be so happy just teaching to the blackboard, in a sense. There is a totally different side that you could call facilitation that we ignore if we do that. Now, what's facilitation? Huh. If you push it to an extreme, that would be teaching or helping students learn, at least, on a topic that you know nothing about. Can you imagine yourself doing that? You know nothing about the material, and you have to help the students learn. That's facilitation. Granted, this, this extreme case is not the most typical case. It did not happen too often in my life, fortunately, but happened once. Let me tell you the story, and then I'm going to ask you what you would have done in my place. I'm called upon to run a program of three days about communication and pedagogy 
from a group of nurses. These were not just any nurses. They had been designated in their respective hospitals as the resource person for learning. That was a new role that had been made compulsory by a legal decree. So as usual on the first day, we'll discuss that later, I asked them to introduce themselves and say what they would like to learn in my workshop and the usual things about teaching and about communication. But then one person says, you know, I've just been bombarded in that new function. I'm not a resource person for learning in my hospital. I don't really know what it's all about, and that's an expectation I have. So mentally, I think, yeah, right, out of scope. I don't need to deal with that. Except that another person said so, and another, and another, and another. I could no longer ignore it. Only that was not my area of expertise. I had no idea. Let me ask you, what would you have done in my place to try to meet that need of theirs, even though you know nothing about that new function. Any suggestion? Yes. Say that louder, please. Right. Well, what do they need to do to, to, do to know? OK, we'll get back to that in a second. What else do you have in mind? What could you have done in my place? You want to help them, help them learn about something that you know nothing about. Never had that question before, huh? <laughs> I can see the look of dismay on your faces. Any suggestion? Yes? Asking questions would be a good idea. Right, maybe the person has the answer. That it's the whole Socratic thinking, right? People already know. They don't know that they know. That's a good start, only I tried that one with a few people who said, you know, I have no idea. And they got defensive and said, well, if I'm asking, it's because I have no idea, OK? So remember this scheme here? Students, interaction, material. I had the students. What kind of material do you think I needed for that to happen? Exactly. That new rule was a legal obligation. That means there was a legal text probably describing roles and responsibilities. So for that, I needed some help. I needed someone to go get me that legal text. And then everything else was organizing the interaction between those who wanted to learn and the legal text they wanted to learn about. OK, how do you organize that interaction? I had 27 people. Hmm? Say that louder. Right. right, you give them the legal text one way or the other. That's no problem. I could have that on a piece of paper, make photocopies, give every person a copy of the text. The question is, then what? Then I say, OK, read that at home and leave me alone. That doesn't lean to the learning just yet. How do you make them learn? Yes. Right, two steps. They have to read it. That's a start. And then they have to interact with it. Reading is not enough. You want interaction? Lots of possibilities. You could ask them questions at that point, like you suggested. Or you could say, well, let's make four groups, maybe with specific questions you want them to answer. Let's them discuss in those four groups. You want to get even more out of that. You say, OK, per group, I want one person to report afterwards to the plenary group. And if you want to go even the next step, and I felt that was my, indeed my area of expertise, is to make a summary of all of that afterwards. So they discuss in the small groups, and I will facilitate that. They report to the plenary group, and I'll take lots of notes, and then I provide a summary of all of that to them, possibly the next day, right? Possibly after sleeping over it and let it filter it a little bit in my system. That's facilitation. Now, I'm not recommending that you enter the classroom saying, you know, Jean-Luc said I did not need to know anything about the material. <laughs> My life is going to be easier from now on. Use both. Use your skills. Heck, use your passion both ways. You want to be a great teacher, you have to be passionate about the material. You know that one. Now, maybe you didn't think of it, but you have to be passionate about the students as well. You don't care about the people in front of you. Not a chance. It's not enough to feel strongly about the topic. You need to work on both. How do we do that? Strategies. Well, we started a bit of interaction. Let's push that a little bit more now that you are warmed up. 
And let me deliberately come up with an example that is probably quite distant from your reality. It's on purpose because it obliges you to take distance. It also is an example that's a little more extreme, and so it should stick a little better in your memory. Let's take a class of first aid, such as the ones probably taught in this country by the Red Cross. All right, give me, for the whole first aid course, the overall objective. By the end of the course, comma, participants will be able to, yes, loud, Provide emergency care. Let's try to be more specific because emergency care is still very vague. Perform CPR. Perform CPR would be a more specific objective indeed. Okay, let's try to be in between because there's more than CPR in first aid, but that's part of it. Stabilize the patient until somebody comes and takes over. Yes, you want an even simpler one. How about saving lives? Reacting in a situation of life threatening emergency. That's the overall idea. OK, that's too vague for us to get down to the details. Let's take a specific lesson and not CPR. I have a better one for you, a more visual one. Let's take the lesson on bleeding. Oh, joy. OK, that's not the course. It's just one lesson. By the end of the lesson, comma, participants will be able to stop bleeding. And you may be more specific and say it's only for abundant bleeding. We're not talking about three drops of blood. It's also for external bleeding. It's very difficult to control internal bleeding for the lay people, at least without equipment. Let's go for that. All right. I give you 12 people. I give you two hours. By the end of the two hours, those participants must be able to control abundant external bleeding and be able to do so for the rest of their life. We don't want them to just pass an exam and then forget about it, okay? That's not first date. What do you do? Go wild. Brainstorm. Anyone? Yes? Learn by doing. Learn by doing. <laughs> you seem to have reservations about that. <laughs> well, let's pick on that exactly. Remember the model. Let me insist it's, in a sense, as simple as that. Students interacting with the material. What's the material in this case? Bleeding. So you have the students, you need bleeding, and then you need them to interact. So every time I ask my training participants on workshops, how do you do that? One of them will make a big joke of saying, well, you take one of the 12 participants and you just stab him wildly. And they're all surprised to hear me say, well, it's exactly that, except, of course, that we're not going to do it for real. That would be disrespectful. We are going to pretend. Let's simulate bleeding. OK, how do you simulate bleeding? Fake blood. Fake blood. I heard ketchup. Yes, why would ketchup work? Well, you really have to go to the essence of things. That, that I'm not telling you anything new, right? In whatever work you do, research in particular, you have to go to the essence. What's bleeding? Well, it involves blood. What's blood? Don't give me a definition. Give me practically for a simulation situation. What is blood? What do we need? Liquid. What else? Sticky. Ketchup will work fine. Thank you. You forgot the most obvious one because it's so obvious. Red. OK. Liquid, sticky, and red. Ketchup a little bit diluted might just work. Now, what do you do with that? You, you, just, you could have a friend simulate, right? It's better than a participant. You'll see why in a moment. Here's my friend John who's going to simulate. What do I do? Just, just put a bit of ketchup on his arm? Is that bleeding? What is bleeding? Painful would be one thing. That's no problem. He can scream uh, going around in circle like a lunatic about it. He can do that. There's more. What's bleeding? Yes. Right. You want to help people control the bleeding. If you don't have flow of your red sticky liquids, you don't have bleeding. So how do you do that? Well, the classic way is to take a transfusion equipment. But yes, you discard the needle. You just take the tubing and the pouch. You fill that with your red liquid. You put that under the clothes of your friend John here with the pouch under the arm and the end of the tube wherever he's going to pretend to cut himself. So he needs bleeding. There we go, right? 
That's bleeding. It's as simple as that. OK, we've got bleeding. Now we need to organize the interaction between the learners and the bleeding. How do you do it? Yep. You could demonstrate. That's true. Only there is not so much that you can demonstrate in this case. You could explain. What's even stronger than demonstrate and explain? Right? You could have a student demonstrate. Let me change just that verb. You could have a student discover. Why is this important? Well, think about the objectives. If you ever heard about objectives, I've bet you, I would bet you've heard about taxonomies. Bloom's taxonomy is a complicated thing. I like the, the light version myself. Objectives could be knowledge, skills, or attitudes. What you know, what you can do, and, and your capacity to actually do it. Now take bleeding. Where do you think the learning mostly is? How much do you need to know to stop bleeding? Not much. How many skills are involved? Not much. Contrary to CPR, CPR would be much more skills. Problem with bleeding is not being able to do it, it's being willing to do it. If after this lecture you come across an accident scene and somebody's bleeding all over, the challenge will be, well, do I actually want to help? Uh, have I got clothes that I'm ready to make dirty, for example? Most of the learning is at the attitude level. Let them discover. That's what it's all about. Now, you could do the, the classic approach that many people tell me to do. You're happily giving your lesson, and suddenly your friend John barges in, bleeding all over everyone, and you expect that somebody will act. Yeah, fat chance. First of all, the situation is not clear enough for them. They will assume that you, the instructor, will do something about it. Second, you are adding an unnecessary stress that does not lead to learning. Have a situation in which the bleeding will take place. You, you pick on the participant. You say, well, um, Mary, for example, would you be willing to be the learner tonight? OK, Mary, let's put you here. This is the living room. And here you are reading the Wall Street Journal. And this here is John. John is your husband. And he is in the kitchen right here peeling potatoes for dinner. Any question? OK, go. Notice, I did not say that the lesson was about bleeding. Because for an objective like that one, the surprise effect counts. OK, what do you think Mary is going to do the first time we do an exercise like that? Where will her eyes go? Briefly to John going, ah, and started bleeding all over. And then where will she look? Either at me or at the rest of the group, which is a really bad idea. Because an essential learning point of first aid is time, real time. You don't want her to start discussing with the rest of the group, what would you do in my place? And there's a poor guy and, you know, losing pretty much all of his blood on the floor. You want real time. So this situation is just for Mary, the learner, and John, the actor. I'm not in there. The group is not in there. If they look at me with desperate eyes, I say, well, I'm not in your apartment. Handle it. All right. What do you have to do to control bleeding? Do you at least know that one? Direct pressure in the right place. OK. What do you think is the probability that people figure that out on their own? Would you say low or high? It's high. It's high. They may not know why they do what they do. They will be a little panicked at first, trying to find something that will help them. And then in front of the urgency of the situation and the amount of ketchup on the floor, they will remember their garden hoses with a hole in it, and they'll just whoops, push on it and say, well, <laughs> for lack of a better thing, I will at least do that meanwhile. So this is why the situation works well. You would not work with discovery for CPR. You don't want them to invent a new method. That's the worst they could do. You want to teach them a very specific one at something else. But for something like this, let them discover. All right, next question to you to see how good you are at first aid. How long should you be applying pressure? Until the bleeding stops. <laughs> yeah, it will stop immediately if you apply the pressure well. That's not the answer. Until someone takes over. Now that, they don't know. That, they won't figure out up front. 
But we can build the situation so they figure it out. So what do you think I told my friend John here in case that the training participant stops the pressure? Say, okay, if she releases the pressure, you bleed again. And this is what happens pretty much every time, right? The Mary in my example will find a way to stop that bleeding and will go, ah, it stopped. And then she will look at me and I will say, go on. And so she will look around, not knowing what to do, and then it never fails. Within a minute or so, they will go. <laughs> and pardon my French, but this is what I like to call an oh shoot kind of learning. <laughs> Because they will start again and go, ah, shoot. <laughs> now, of course, we'll talk about that afterwards. But there is not much to discuss. The learning has taken place already. She will remember that for the rest of her life, and so will the rest of the group. Now, she still doesn't know how long to apply pressure, but she knows longer than what I have done so far. And chances are she won't take any chance there. So the next learning point, did she call 911? If not, you're going to stay there for a long, long time, <laughs> and so on. There is so much you can build in the situation. For example, I tell my friend John, if she does not put you in a seated or lying position within two minutes, you faint. Similarly, the knife that John has been using for peeling the potatoes, a fake knife, okay, it's learning, he will drop that knife on the floor. And you could make the situation more interesting by saying a neighbor comes by to see if the person needs any help. And wouldn't you know it, if Mary didn't do anything about the knife, there comes the guy in flip-flops and hurts his foot on the knife. That's potentially another learning point, if you think it's appropriate. Good. How long do you let that go like that? When do you say stop? Any suggestions? Because at the moment, all I say is go on, right? When will I say stop? For what reason? Yes? Right. It's about learning. So if you don't learn anything anymore, then you can stop. As long as you learn, it doesn't matter if what the person does is correct or incorrect. As long as we learn, we go on. We stop if we stop learning. And obviously, we stop if it becomes dangerous for anyone, right? I've seen, not for bleeding, but for burns, I've seen once uh, a training participant who thought, ah, water on the burn. Yes, <laughs> cold water. Only in the panic, he went to the tap and he filled the container with boiling water <laughs> and he was ready to pour that on my friend John here. And that's, of course, when you say, okay, stop, time. <laughs> we need to talk about this first before you do anything else and so on. Okay, and afterwards, we talk about it. Who is the first to have the right, not to say the obligation, to talk about it? Who would you say? Yep. Yeah, the discoverer. Mary, in my example. Why Mary? Well, lots of reasons. First of all, she's been in a stressful situation. It's good for her to let a number of things out. So I'm not going to ask her, did you think you did this correctly? I'm going to ask her, how did that go? Very vague, so she can talk about it freely. That's the first reason. Second reason, she can say things that nobody else can say. I don't want anyone in the room to say she was very nervous. You don't know that. You may have seen symptoms, but you don't know. She can say it. Third, when you know you've done something wrong, like not apply pressure long enough, it's so much nicer to say it yourself than to get it in the face from someone else, right? Imagine I don't let her speak and somebody says, you know, I think you should have applied pressure longer. There she will be going, I know, I know, come on, don't rub it in. <laughs> I didn't rub it in, I know that one. If she can say herself, you know, I, one thing I will remember from this situation is, well, I don't know how long to apply pressure, but longer than what I did, perfect. Okay, number one, the learner, the discoverer, the person who's been doing the exercise. Number two, who else will be someone who can uniquely give a perspective on the situation. John, the actor, he too can say things that nobody else can say. For example, how he felt. Did he feel reassured by the action of our first aider? Or did he feel the actions of the first aider were, were adding to his panic? <laughs> Only he can say that. Good. Number three, who gets the word? Who else is there? <laughs> 
the rest of the group, which means maybe you should have given them instructions up front to look carefully, to take note, possibly even dividing the observations. You three look at how sh she will handle the victim. You three will look at how she will call emergency medical services. You three will look at how she avoids a further accident. You could have done that ahead of time, of course. Talk about it. OK, I think you got the point. Who is the last one to open his or her mouth? The instructor. So if you thought being a teacher is all about speaking to people, bad news for you. In fact, you do a lot of speaking, but in the facilitation category. Where is the learning? Well, it comes from the feedback. If you still believe practice makes perfect, well, if you don't have feedback, nothing is going to make you perfect in that category. My favorite example, look at people who have been writing papers for 20 years and still write very poor papers. Cryptic, boring, the way they believe a paper really should be written in a sense. If you don't have somebody to give you feedback on that, you're not going to improve. The best feedback is from the situation itself. The instructions you give to the actor in my example, but in other contexts, it may be lots of other things. Like you give them an exercise to do, give them the answer. The answer is five millivolts. And if they get that answer, then most likely they found the correct reasoning. If they get something else, they can figure out what they did wrong. Next feedback from the other students, who will have a lot to say. Even though you may be the expert on the subject, if it's the students saying it, it's so much more accepted by other students than if you say it yourself. Especially intelligent students like you have at this university, they are critical thinkers. They're not going to accept things on arguments of authority. Don't tell them, I know and believe me. Let them figure it out by themselves, then they will believe it. And again, you're the last in line. See the change of paradigm? We're no longer the emitter for the receiver who are the students. We no longer lecture. Now our job is to catalyze the learning. Catalysts is what it's all about. Make it possible. How so? Design activities. Think of what you need and how that's going to happen in space and in time. And then facilitate the activity. Make sure it happens. This is not giving up. This is not saying, well, you know, let's go problem-based learning. I give them a problem, and then I just go to my office, and they figure it out. There is a lot about making sure it happens. What do you need so it happens? Well, the first thing, no surprise to you, you need motivation. Ah, the common complaint of teachers, yeah, my students don't learn, but hey, not my fault. They're not motivated. These days, it's really bad. You know, in my time, we were all motivated. Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> Like we believe that one. Now, I like to think of motivation as a belief. What do you have to believe to be motivated to learn? Tell me. If you don't believe that, you're not motivated. Yes? The relevance, you have to believe that it's a good idea, that you have a benefit out of it, it's desirable, not enough. You have to believe that you can. You have to believe not only that it's desirable, but also that it is possible. And that's where you can work. Instead of saying, you know, students are not motivated, which may be true, it may be a fact, ask yourself the question, well, what do I do about it? It may be what you do, it may be what you don't do as well. For example, making them believe that the learning is useful requires a connection with their life. And that connection cannot just be, yes, you will see in five years when you finish your master, you will use that a lot in your professional life. Like that's going to motivate a, a freshman about any material. Of course not. You need to make it a lot more concrete. You want my favorite example? Because so many different schools have a course about that. Probabilities and statistics. Take probabilities to start with what's the canonical example to understand probabilities. Pulling black balls and red balls from urns. Like you do that every day, right? <laughs> Look in textbooks, it's all over the place. And sometimes you put them back before you pull another one. Sometimes you don't. Just change that. Imagine you tell them, look, you, were, you had a party last night, you were a little fuzzy this morning, but you have to get dressed to go to class. You pull two socks at random from your drawer. What's the probability that you have a matching pair, uh, given the socks you have in your drawer? 
you'll see a different shift of interest. They will actually want to know the answer to that one. I remember some stuff from my statistics classes because it applied to my reality at the time. I've used statistics a lot since then, but I didn't know that at the time. The one I remember is going to university with public transportation, like the train, or going to university hitchhiking. And the interesting conclusion from that specific exercise is that hitchhiking on average is faster. But the standard deviation around the average is so large that for starting at the same time, you would be late much more often hitchhiking than taking the train, even though on average it's faster. I'll remember that for the rest of my life because guess what? I was hitchhiking a lot at the time. I could project myself in the situation. Make the connection one way or the other. It's not that hard if you brainstorm a little bit with yourself. Now take the second one, making them believe that something is possible. What I witness in universities is many examples of the opposite. You want a classic example from Europe, Belgium in particular, it's changing now, but for a long time the system is such that you have to pass all your exams of the first year to be admitted to the second year. You don't just accumulate credits. If you fail your year, you have to do the whole year again. The success rate of that first year is fairly low because universities don't select students, so you can register anyone for any school. Typically, it's 30, 35%, so say one in three. Now, with good intentions, or so the naive me chooses to believe, professors on the first day of the first year try to shake students awake to that reality. And what they say to students is this, you know, Success rate in the first year is as low as one in three. So look at the person seated on your left, look at the person seated on your right. Out of the three of you, only one will still be here next year. Now, who is the person seated next to you? With a bit of luck, you, your buddies from high school. And obviously, one of them will be better than the others. And so many students will go, wait a minute, I, I know him, he was in high school with me, he's better than I am, so if it's only one of the three who will be there next year, it will be him. I have no chance. Now if I push it a little bit, yes, I know I exaggerate, but it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You make students fail by telling them that they are going to fail. It's a well-documented process. I'm myself extremely sensitive to gender stereotypes and sexism, and, and that's right in, right? Why is it that statistically girls don't do as good on their math test as boys? Because they've been told that they are not as good at math. You take a group of boys and girls and you tell both of them that they're equally good and they perform equally well on the exam. Isn't that interesting? Make them believe it's possible. So if you want to shake them awake and say, hey, look, it's possible, but it's tough, try to say something positive. I remember my second year, the course that would fail everyone pretty much was thermodynamics. We were just so scared of thermodynamics. And on the first day, the professor said, you might have heard that it's a really tough course. You have heard correct. It's tough, many people fail the exam. But I can promise you one thing. If you work from week one, and you keep up to date with the whole program to the end, you can succeed. That's a promise I have for you. This is also a warning about, hey, it's tough, but it's a more positive one. You also have to tell your students when they are able to do something, you have to wake them up to that fact as well, they won't realize for themselves. Let me take a totally different context. There I was teaching statistical thinking for lawyers in an insurance company. The, the objective, the final objective was to calculate, calculate an insurance premium, as opposed to looking it up in a book or just, you know, using your experience, which is basically seeing which way the wind is coming. And those people had never done that, but it was very necessary. It was corporate insurance. A company is not another company. You cannot use uh, large statistics. You have to adapt each time. I was, at some point, running them through case studies, and as I was passing through the groups to unblock them, so was the CEO of that company in person, the person who wanted that training program, and I remember he was in one of those groups checking an answer and then saying to that person, do you realize? For the first time in your life, you just calculated an insurance premium and correctly on top of that. 
And I looked at the participant, and she first frowned as she was taking that information in, and then she beamed one of those happy faces like I haven't seen very often in my life, because yes, she had done the problem. She should have realized that yourself, herself, but pointing it out to her was making the difference then in terms of believing that yes, it's possible, yes, she could. Not that I want to be an Obama fan and say, yes, we can, but, but there is a bit of that too, right? This belief that we can actually do these things. Good. Now, students may believe that and still not be ready to do the activities you want them to do. From talking in front of the class or going to the blackboard all the way to exposing themselves and their clothes to somebody bleeding, right? You cannot just take 12 people on day one of a first aid course and say, okay, let's get started. You, for example, whatever your name is, come here, something's gonna happen, handle it. You're going to see people running out of the room screaming, they're not ready for that. You need to build an atmosphere that makes it possible. An atmosphere that makes in particular that they are no longer afraid to say things in front of the class, to do things in front of the class. As long as they're afraid, not a chance. Even if you threaten them to great participation, then you'll have a few people who would say whatever crosses their mind just so you put check in the ca category participation. That's not really what you want. Now, you know what the problem is? Building an atmosphere is not through what you do, it is through what you don't do. So it takes time. And no amount of verbal information really solves the issue even in a very low context culture like the United States where everything can and should be said and used against you in the course of law as well. Imagine you come the first day and you tell students, you know, in this class you can really say what you have in mind and nothing bad will happen. What's the chance that they actually believe that? You want to know why it doesn't work? Try this on, on a stranger. Approach a stranger and say to that person, you know, you can trust me. <laughs> what reaction do you get? People go, wait a minute, if he's saying that, then it must be something fishy. It should go without saying. You have to make them feel that it's okay to speak their mind, and that's tough. Now let's start with the negative. How to destroy an atmosphere entirely? Well, if you ask me, there are three things you can do. Judgments, reproaches, and interpretations. Judgment, you know. You imagine that if you look at a student who just said something and you say, what a stupid remark. <laughs> That's not going to reflect well on the atmosphere of the class. That's the obvious one. What you might not realize is that a positive judgment is as bad as a negative one. If you say to someone in your class, wow, what a clever remark, you may feel, well, come on, I'm encouraging the atmosphere here. It's a positive remark. It's a judgment. There's nothing objective about it. You make a judgment. That's clever. And people feel that if you allow yourself to say that some of those things are clever, you would allow yourself as easily to say that some of these things are stupid. Even if they don't go that far in their reasoning, they would just be the comparison. They would go, wait a minute, when I said something, she did not say that it was a clever comment. And now somebody else says something, and she says to that person, it's a clever comment. My comment must have been really stupid when I think of it. No judgment. Try to connect to facts. You can say that's a comment that comes at the perfect timing for the sequence of the course. That's an objective statement. It's positive, but it's not a judgment. It's not good, bad, in a sense. Avoid judgments, even positive ones. Second thing. Avoid reproaches. What's a reproach? Or if you ask me, it's a sentence that starts with, you should have. That is very tough on people. Classic example from my training programs. <coughs> Practice session for oral presentations. Group of five, each of them in turn gives a presentation and then with a the group we discuss it exactly like we described for the bleeding exercise. First the person who did the presentation, then the rest of the group. Now a classic comment would be to say about the slides, you should have used a bigger font. Implied in there because I could not read the font you had. That is just so negative. Stick to facts. Just say, I could not read the font on your slides. 
That doesn't mean you should have. That means I couldn't. That's a fact. Nobody can agree or disagree with that. Nobody can say, yes, you could read it. Only you would know that. If you want to be a little less self-centered, I could not read, and still a little more participant-oriented, at least be future-oriented, not past-oriented. A reproach is always about the past. You should have in the past. Then say something like, next time, I think you want to try a bigger font. That will give you a better slide in a general room. That's future-oriented. So by the way, you realize that this means don't do it yourself. It also means don't let anyone in your session do that to someone else, right? You have a participant reproaching something to another participant. You intervene immediately and say, no, don't, don't start making reproaches. Tell me what the problem was for you. Well, I could not read the slide. OK, that's a fact. That's what I want to hear. Last one on the list, my favorite one. You know, one day I'm hoping to write a book about the logical mistakes that even PhD students and postdocs do in their everyday life. And one of those is interpretation, drawing a conclusion that you cannot draw. In my session sessions, it may be something like, obviously, you did not spend much time preparing this presentation. Well, you don't know that. There is no way you could know that. You can suspect it. You can observe symptoms. For example, you can say that was totally disorganized. Or uh, you hesitated six times about what to say next. Those are facts. But you cannot say, obviously, you did not prepare. That's a classic thing, right, from professors. Obviously, you didn't spend any time on your homework. You can't say that. And if you're wrong, it is really, really tough on people. It, it seems so unfair. Avoid that. Don't do it yourself. Don't let other people do it either. Now, not very helpful what I'm doing here, right? I'm telling you what not to do. Can I also tell you what to do? Well, it's much tougher because it's really about what you don't do, nonverbal communication. But let me at least point you in one direction about building an atmosphere. It starts, ideally, on day one. If you have a class of 30 students, you don't have a class. That's the problem. You have 30 students. You do not have a group. Priority, build a group, and then make them learn in group spirit. How do you build a group? Well, here's a simplistic model about group dynamics. You know I only do simple things. I don't do complicated models. Simple model helps me so much. A person does not belong in the group until he or she shares the verbal and the nonverbal space of that group. Let's start with the second one, the nonverbal, the physical space. Classic example, you've got a group of students right here and then two students over there. Far, in physical space, they don't belong to the group. Watch how you set up your rooms, especially if you're lucky enough to have flexible furniture you can rearrange. Myself, I will always put exactly the number of chairs necessary for the number of students that I have. And of course, the one person who will come late tries to enter the room inconspicuously and then will, as discreetly as possible, take a chair from the pile and add it behind everything. And if that person, if I let that person do that, that person will not be part of the group for the rest of the session. So I'll have to interrupt myself and unfortunately point out to everyone that, yes, they are late, <laughs> even if I do that the most friendly way possible. But I'll say, oh, please don't add a chair. We save the place for you right here, which is also a way to welcome them. And there's a space for them. It goes even for very small breaks. Remember the practice sessions I was telling you about? Five participants plus me, six chairs. When one participant gets up to give a talk in front of the rest, that's an empty chair. If you have this situation where there are four people, an empty chair, and then one last person, when we analyze the presentation, we realize that eye contact went from the speaker to the four people and not to that single person who is separated from the rest of the group by nothing more than one empty chair. So I let that happen the first time so we notice it. And then the next time, I make people move so we never have an empty chair. It's very unpleasant to be cut like that. Nonverbal space, group people. You want another one that uh, always surprises my clients when I do it. Few people seem to dare to do it. You want proximity? Remove all the tables, if you can. Put just chairs. 
When we do that, we give people a, a special notepad with a very, very heavy cardboard back so they can actually take notes on their lap reasonably easily. We remove the tables. But it's amazing how it improves interaction. They're closer to each other. They're closer to me, the instructor, as well. No barriers in the way all the tables are gone if I can help it. And of course, make people move. They all sit in the back of the room. There's no way you can change the room. It's fixed chairs like here. Well, I'm a specialist of going to the back of the room and making people move. Now, the thing about that is you have to ask twice. The first time you go to the back of the room and say, can I please ask you to get up and sit in the front? They look at you from head to toe, and they have this face that seems to say, he did not actually ask that I would move, did he? But then you just look at them in the eyes, and you insist, and you say, I mean it. Please get up now and move to the front. And then they seem to snap awake or something, and they go, OK, oh, well, oh, whatever, and then they go to the front. Insist. You have to mean it. If you go to the back of the room saying, I'm going to ask them, but I'm convinced already they will not move, you will be right, of course. They will not move. Good. That's the nonverbal space. Verbal space, well, a person does not belong in a group until that person has spoken in front of the group or among the group. So make them speak. Make them speak as soon as possible. If I push it a little bit, I would say, make them say whatever. It would already be good. But if we're going to make them speak, we might as well ask them to say something useful for the rest of the class. My classic sequence for self-introductions at the beginning of a session, a workshop, is this. Tell me your name. Tell me something about your situation. Typically for grad students, is tell me something about your research. Tell me what you expect from the class, which may be expressed in different ways. It may be, tell me what you see as your biggest challenge for writing papers. That's a question I asked yesterday in a workshop here at University of Chicago. And then I asked them something personal, for example, their favorite food. Let's take them one at a time. In fact, for most of my workshops, I ask people to send me a, a photograph in advance. By the time they get to the session, I know their name. In a number of cases, they all know each other's names as well, because they all come from the same department or research group or whatever. So the name is not really useful to learn who is who. Why do I still ask the name? Well, it's an affirmation of self. If you say, I am, and then you say your name, in a sense, you take your place in the group. Then something like their situation, not classical thing. I don't want to hear about the name of their department or the name of their professor. I want something more specific. What kind of research do you do? Say something about your research. Expectations helps me either focus the training program or just manage the expectations. One that I had yesterday in my writing workshop, I asked them their biggest challenge for writing papers. A few of them said, my biggest challenge is English. I'm a non-native speaker. And then I had to say, OK, that in itself is out of scope for this afternoon. This is not a language class. What I'm going to teach you about writing, I teach in English, in French, in Dutch, in Spanish. It's universal. It's not about the language. I manage the expectations that way. The most surprising one for my training participants and probably for you for the last few minutes, why the hell do you ask them their favorite food? Well, it's for the reason I mentioned. I want them to say something personal. Remember, they might, in my sessions, have to criticize each other about speaking. That can get very personal sometimes about the way people use their body or their voice when they give a talk. It's personal stuff. I want to start to be personal. Break the ice, in a sense. Now, I could ask so many things in the category personal things, but some of them would be inappropriate, right? Imagine I ask them something personal, such as, do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or are you otherwise married? That's kind of very personal. And imagine somebody broke up last night. <laughs> Ouch, that question is going to hurt. I've been trying other things, like uh, tell us your favorite musical group. My experience was either people had never heard of that group, or they had heard about it, but they were disapproving strongly of that kind of music. And so it was creating all sorts of situations. Another classic, it was in September. I thought it's just after the summer. Let's ask them where they went on vacation. And sincerely, I have no judgment about that. You stayed at home, or you went to Hawaii, I don't care. But they cared. They were afraid of what other people might think. When one of them said, I went to the Bahamas, the next one in line said, and I did not go to the Bahamas. 
they were comparing themselves. I was surprised, but then I realized, okay, bad question. So what's good about favorite food? Well, everybody has one. Even if you find it entirely disgusting, it's still kind of fun, really. You, you would say, oh, in a funny kind of way. Plus, if you think yourself that your favorite food is going to sound disgusting for the rest of the group, you can lie. So I'm asking you to be personal, but you can be as much or as little personal as you want. Some people share a lot and say, what I really like is empanadas the way my mom cooks them. <laughs> Very personal. And some people say, favorite food, mm, fish. And you think they say that they might have said something else, maybe the same to them. Never mind. Everyone is free to go as little or as much personal as they want to. It's a safe question. If I don't ask about favorite food, I ask about favorite color. It's a bit the same category. But I don't do that too often because I teach a lot of engineers, and it gets pretty boring. By and large, engineers prefer blue for some reason. <laughs> One day I'll figure it out why and write a paper about it. <laughs> At the moment, I'm just collecting the statistics on this. Now, question, what do I do while they are all introducing themselves? Well, the short answer is nothing. The better answer is active listening. I take notes. In fact, the only one I write down is expectations for the course. And I really need the favorite food to finish writing my sentence there. It's a nice way to wrap it up as well. If I don't have a little something simple at the end of it to wrap it up, then they drag on, and we have a big group, so we have to move on. They say, my favorite food is uh, pizza. OK, that's a clear signal for the next one to start. I just listen. I take notes. The only thing I will say, apart maybe for clarification questions, will be, thank you, comma, name of the person. Person finished. OK, thank you, John. Next person. The first one is, is usually quite tense. And that tenseness dies out exponentially really fast. The second one may still be a little tense. And the third one is looking at that and saying, OK, two people did it already. And nothing bad seems to have happened to them. The instructor didn't make fun of them or anything. So I guess it's safe. See how this is really about what you don't do? In the same category, will I introduce myself as well? Of course. The question is, first or last? First might be justifiable in the sense that you say, well, if I'm asking you to do it, I do it myself too. Problem is, I'm not a good model for them. If they imitate what I said, then it's not really working, because what I want to know about them is not what exactly they want to know about me. I use the same canvas to talk about myself, but I cheat a little bit, right? Heck, I don't do research anymore. Expectations for the course are a bit different as well. So I would rather go last for those reasons and for the nonverbal message it sends. If I go last, it's really telling the class, hey, guys, here, you first, me afterwards. Which also means this presentation exercise, I will do really, really, really fast. Yes, I will welcome them to the training program. I will say something to place it in context. But that is maximum 60 seconds. After a minute or perhaps two, they must be speaking already. If I wait 20 minutes to do this, they will sink progressively on their chair and be in a passive position. That is not what we want. So yes, you can build an atmosphere. All right, let's sum that up. huh? It's all about the objectives. You know what? My dream would be, I know it's got practical limitations, but the dream would be if a professor teaches a class, that professor does not administer the exam for that class. Somebody else does. It's so much easier to prepare someone for somebody else's exam, because then you can really give everything you want to give to them. You don't have to say, hmm, I shouldn't say that, because if I say it now, that will be too easy for the exam. That would be a nice system. Who does that, for example? The driving school, they have to prepare you for the exam of government agency. They can really give you all the tips and tricks and help you as much as they can. Have objectives. It will be the guide for your time management, for the activities you create, because strategies, point two, is really just that. I know my examples may seem very distant from what you do, but no matter what you teach, I promise you, and if you don't believe me, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll prove it to you, it's as simple as saying, once you have the objective, OK, I've got students, I've got material, 
What activity can I think of in which they exercise or discover that capacity that I have written down in my objective? It's straightforward. It's the same as saying, I need students, I need blood, and I need an activity that will prompt students to discover how to stop the bleeding. That direct so. But do remember the success factors, right? Don't just say, okay, I'll try that on instant one of day one of my class and then conclude that it doesn't work because nobody wants to be exposed to the rest of the group and then never again do it. Yes, you need to build a group. It takes time. It is time well invested. If you take even half an hour, possibly even an hour, for people to build a group, everything afterwards will be so much easier, you will recoup your time invested. Let me finish with an analogy. Imagine that you want to teach kids how to ride a bicycle, okay? Well, if you entrust university professors with this task, what would be the uni university approach to teaching kids how to ride a bicycle? Well, obviously, there is no way you can really ba balance a bicycle if you don't understand deeply the principles of addition and conservation of angular momentum. So the first thing you do is a two-hour class on addition and conservation of angular momentum, because that's fundamental to understanding how a bicycle rides. You know, my first aid class in Belgium, since it's about saving life, the first two hours was about life, namely the cell with the nucleus, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, and the whole thing, like that's going to help the day that you meet somebody bleeding in front of you. Now, next thing, you've given them a two-hour class on addition and conservation of angular momentum. Now you're going to check whether they can balance a bicycle by giving them a multiple choice exam, right? If they can answer those questions, obviously they can balance a bicycle. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but more realistically, what would a university teacher do Active methods, so he or she thinks. Demonstration. So you put the kid there on a seat, you go on the bicycle and you tell the kid, that is going to teach you how it's done. Watch and learn. And then you pass five times with the bicycle in front of the kid and you go, okay, have you seen? Then you can do it yourself. Come on, like you're going to see anything from that. It's like trying to, to learn how to play tennis by watching the Wimbledon tournament. If those are pros, it looks easy, right? It's, there's nothing to tennis. Look on TV. They just hit the ball, and it goes exactly where they want it to be. That's all there is. Of course, it's not going to work. The only way is discovery. So what's your job? Well, as usual, instead of talking to them, instead of showing them something they won't understand, because if it's well done, you don't understand what's done, then remember what we said, design, facilitate activities. Remember motivation, it must make it possible, desirable, and that includes safe to experiment. So what you do? Well, in that case, you could build, you could break it down in steps. My kids at their school, they had an external instructor come to teach them how to ride a bicycle. And the first thing they did, they had to be next to the bicycle with the two hands on the handlebar and go around the recess area. Okay, once they were there, turn around, now one hand on the handlebar, the other hand on the saddle. And now they go the other way like that. Already they feel the movement of the bike a little more. Last time, just the hand of the saddle. And you suddenly realize that this front wheel is going left or right whenever you tilt the bike one way or the other. And then on the bike without the pedals, and then with the pedals, etc. You, you break it down. That's making it possible. If it looks like it's impossible in one go, you make it possible. Desirable, that's usually not a problem for kids who want to ride a bicycle, but if necessary, project the outcome of that. Make them realize everything that will become possible once they can ride a bicycle. And obviously, they're not going to experiment if it's not safe. The same way that your students will not speak their mind in front of the class if they don't feel it's safe. So here, what makes it safe? Well, some knee protectors and uh, wrist protectors and elbow protectors would be good. What's missing in this picture? Come on, if that were my daughter, she would have her helmet. And let me tell you something else. Her protectors would not be pink. Come on, what a stereotype again. So this is the whole idea. Let me finish with an obstacle and a promise. 
The obstacle about those active methods, and no, I'm, I'm not throwing the traditional lecture through the window, but yes, you can do that one. I want you to push to do active methods. The obstacle is that you cannot start doing it a little bit at a time. You cannot go progressively from passive to active students. It's a jump. It's a leap of faith. At some point, you have to let go. You have to ask an open question to the group, like I did this morning with you, and then you have to deal with whatever the group gives you. If you say, no, that's not what I wanted to hear, you're not doing active teaching or learning. You are just making them guess what you would have said if you were lecturing. That is not active methods. You have to jump in the water, in a sense. I know that's tough. There is a leap of faith, and a number of you would be afraid to do that because you think, oh, if I let go, I lose all of the control. Well, aren't we all perfectionists and control freaks? But I can make a promise for that. It's going to be so much more fun. I can't believe some professors are giving exactly the same lecture year after year over a career of at least 30 years. And they're talking alone for hours, and they have no idea if people in front of them are even listening. That must be so sad. Now, you do active teaching, you make them say and do and discover. Every time you have another group of students, it's going to be different. Every time I do that, and I do a lot of that, I still learn things. Even though I'm supposed to be the expert, well, I maybe learn exponentially less and less, but I still learn stuff, and I go, hey, that I didn't know before. So let me leave you with that promise, despite the obstacle. And before I take questions, just close with something that's not very original, but trust me, it's very sincere. I would like simply to wish each and every one of you every success with your upcoming classes here at the University of Chicago. Now, I've been talking alone way too long already. I'm sure you have questions. Who wants to ask the first question? Ah, come on, I don't believe you. Yes, go ahead. Uh huh? You gave an easy example. Which, yep. Has, it's by its nature a, like a practical field. Right. But what about, you know, I mean, what I do, linguistics? There is, I mean, for the most of the material that we cover, it doesn't have any immediate practical application except just knowing this. So what's, what's your field again? Linguistics. Linguistics. Oh, come on. Let's do a group <laughs> brainstorming. We can see lots of applications to linguistics. You know, my son is studying Latin in school, and that's something that many parents and students don't see the use of. But we see it all the time. Now, you have to point it out. We keep throwing words at him and say, you know this word? Now, with what you, the Latin you had in school, I bet you can guess. Analyze this word and figure it out. And at the beginning, it's, oh, my parents are annoying me. And at the end, they, they are playing with that. Now, linguistics, like anything else, is taught and researched because it's part of our life. I'm sure you can find implications for that. And quite frankly, I know it sounds severe what I'm going to say, but if you don't find any link with life, question whether you really need to teach that to students. There's always a link. I'm sure we can find one. Come and talk to me at the end. Other questions? Yes? So in both of these practical examples, you gave, involved uh, teaching skills for the students. Right. Oh, artificial attitude, yes. Attitude, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course. Critical thinking is a skill, if you decide to call it that. Let's talk about that. So in the humanities, you may not have to control bleeding or handle technology and so on. Now, philosophy, you said, let me give you an example of active teaching that took place in a university in Belgium. It was having students develop critical thinking and argumentation on the basis of specific questions, one that I remember is, do computers think? Now, what they were supposed to do is a role play 
in which each person in the role play would defend the point of view of a famous philosopher. So they would in fact have to, what, what, what became possible is to have philosophers from totally different centuries come together in one room, or as it happened on that case, in one web space, and use argumentation. So there were lots of different questions, and they had to understand the philosophical approach of one specific philosopher, pretend they were that person, and try to convince other pretend philosophers on that point of view. Now, again, this is not a situation when the teaching assistant or the professor says, well, while they are doing that, I'll just go get a cup of coffee, right? Because they had to check that the argumentation was indeed faithful to that of the philosopher, and they had to go and probe them, saying, you know what you said, that that's not really what Thomas Aquinas would have said. Try hard. Go back to the book on page 72 to 85, read that, and then try to refine your argumentation, which is why they did it through a web-mediated platform, so that stayed, and they could go back and iterate and change progressively. This is assuming, of course, that the skill, or whatever you call it, that you want to develop is critical thinking, argumentation. And this is not done without resources. They needed the books, they needed access to the thinking of those philosophers, so they had a, a basis on which to work. It's not the idea of saying, well, whatever, I'll, uh, arguments, uh, I'm good at that, I did debate in high school. No, it had to be faithful to the philosopher. So that's perfectly possible. I hear your question, and that was the same as the other question. I know that you still think, yes, it's true for the others, but it's not true for my topic. I reiterate what I said before, and you can challenge me on that. Any topic, you can do it as long as you can give me clear objectives. If you just say, my content is uh, 16th century Renaissance, 17th century Renaissance, France, then you cannot do anything because you don't tell me, well, what, what is it that you want to achieve with that? You tell me what you want to achieve, critical thinking, absorbing philosophies, comparing literature, uh, reading poetry with the right intonation, whatever. Give me the skill, the, the verb of capacity you put in there, I'll give you the activity almost automatically. Anything else to close? Anybody wants the last word? Yes, that would be you. Well, afterwards, you ask your question personally, I will answer them. Would you take the microphone, please? So you mentioned the negative or detrimental effect of positive judgments, right? Um, and that was really surprising to me. I always thought of it as a way of um, like positively reinforcing certain behaviors in the classroom. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that and sure. maybe mention if there are certain um, scenarios in which that would be useful? Right. And also, if you have any resources that we can look at for um, about active learning and active teaching, if you could yep. mention those. Thank you. Let me take the second one first. This is where you can go online to access a number of resources. Now, Remember, I said positive judgment is not such a good idea. It's not the word positive that's the problem. The problem is the word judgment. When it sounds like you arbitrarily decide it's good or it's bad, it's clever or it's stupid. You can certainly do positive reinforcement, but not with words like good or bad. And then the best way to do that is to refer once again to the objective. You did it. Remember what we said about making them believe that it's possible? That's the kind of positive reinforcement you want. Say, look, you expressed correctly the point of view of a philosopher. To take my same example, that's not good or bad. That's not a judgment. It's a fact. You can even express things in the first person. If I read what you wrote on the web platform about this philosopher, I can really recognize the argumentation that the person would have used. That's a fact. I'm saying I can recognize. Nobody can say it's right or it's wrong. It's an observation. Just avoid things like good work. Because if you say good work, it sounds like you could as easily say bad work. Not the judgment. Refer to the objective. All right. My time is up. Let me close the session. But again, if you have some questions additionally, don't hesitate to come and talk to me. Last word for Elizabeth. Let's thank Jean-Luc once more.